Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARDP. My name is Victor Kwasi, and I'll be hosting today's session on combination antibiotic therapy against drug-resistant gram-negative bacteria, where the evidence stands. Revive is GARDP's education and outreach program. It aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. These webinars form part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded and are freely available to view after the live broadcast on our website, revive.godp.org slash webinars. As well as webinar recordings, you can also read our series of articles known as antimicrobial viewpoints. Here our experts discuss various topics within the field. The most recent contribution being one from Stephen Sen on what we can learn from trials for COVID vaccine. COVID-19 vaccines for the development of new antimicrobials. We also have a resources section that includes the antimicrobial encyclopedia. This has definitions on various important terms, and some of these include videos where experts give further explanations on terms such as hit identification and antimicrobial stewardship. This resource will be expanded continuously with new terms and videos, so please keep an eye out for them. As always, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions slide, um, the questions window as shown in the slide. We will address the questions after the presentations and do our best to respond to as many of the questions as possible. Our moderator today will be Gavin Barlow. Gavin is a senior clinical lecturer in infection at Har York Medical School in the UK. Welcome, Gavin. I now hand over to you to introduce our speaker for today. Thanks very much, uh, Victor, and hello, everyone, uh, and thank you uh, for coming to this webinar this morning. Uh, our speaker today is Evelina Tacanelli, who I am sure uh, requires little introduction to uh, many of you. Evelina is Director of the Infectious Diseases section at Verona University in uh, Italy and lecturer in antimicrobial resistance at the University of Turbingen in Germany. Evelina coordinated the WHO priority list of antimicrobial resistant bacteria for the research and development of new effective antimicrobials, as well as the WHO project on the limitations of estimates of the burden of antibiotic resistant infections within the Global Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance System project. She is also chair of the European Committee for Infection Control and a WHO and ECDC consultant for infection control and antimicrobial stewardship. Evelina has a wealth of experience in the participation and coordination of European-wide projects and networks focused on antimicrobial resistance and specifically today will talk to us about combination antimicrobial therapy for the treatment of highly resistant gram-negative infections. Clearly a very hot topic. So I now welcome Evelina to the stage. Uh, thank you very much for your talk this morning, Evelina. Uh, the stage is all yours. So thanks, Gavin. Thanks, uh, Gard P, for this kind invitation. So as announced, the talk today will be about uh, the evidence we have on combination antibiotic therapy against drug-resistant gram-negative uh, uh, bacteria. So this is my declaration uh, of interest. Uh, sorry, just checking. Uh, slides proceeding. I think, Victor, I need your help uh, for these slides. Yes, thanks so much. So, um, as I was saying, this is my declaration of interest for the um, stakeholders and body fundings uh, for the research of my teams uh, uh, in Germany and, uh, uh, and Italy. Uh, next slide. So, we need some preliminary consideration before this talk. 
um, first of all, uh, I will be um, referring uh, a lot about the meaning of combination uh, from papers uh, and guidance document uh, during the, the talk. Uh, but for the sake uh, of clarity uh, and the time, during this talk, when I refer to combination, I'm referring to uh, treatment with more than one antibiotic, uh, and I'm not referring uh, to two molecules within the same antibiotic. Um, so the target drugs I will be covering during this lecture will include all the antibiotics, so from the cholestin till the aminoglycosides, and all the new antibiotics just released on the market just listed here. Uh, there will be reference to guidance document uh, as the one from IDSA and the PIN and guidelines or reviews, not pharma funded, as the one from uh, uh, SAC and uh, ESCMID. I'm also glad to announce that ESCMID is just coming out with um, uh, guidelines for the treatment of infection caused by multidrug resistant gram-negative bacteria in a very short time. Uh, the, 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 during this lecture, I will also referring and presenting shortly the coherence project on combination therapy financed by God P. Um, there will be no reference, unfortunately, to empiric therapy. I do believe empiric therapy is very much important for the recommendation on combination therapy, but unfortunately, in 45 minutes, cannot be covered. I would also strongly suggest to have one dedicated webinar for the empiric therapy, since the rules that empiric therapy has um, in the stewardship uh, uh, intervention. Uh, during this talk, I will not only also covering molecular characterization of resistance, again, very important topic, uh, uh, but cannot be covered uh, as diagnostic during this talk, uh, but I will make specific reference to resistant partners when needed uh, for the combination therapy. Um, as for the target bacteria, uh, I decided to cover the priority one of the critical uh, um, bacteria for R&D of new effective antibiotics that uh, WHO uh, published a few years ago. Um, so we will be referring to carbapenem resistant Tacinetobacter baumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Enterobacterialis. Why the reason for choosing this specific uh, type of bacteria? This is the matrix uh, that we produce for the evidence uh, for WHO. As you can see, there are only these four type of resistant partners of bacteria uh, that are related to high priority and very few evidence related to prevention, community and hospital, current pipeline and treatment options. So the roadmap of the call will cover a very short introduction, then uh, I just changed a bit the order, so I will focus first of all on in vitro evidence, then clinical evidence from human study, and then real life prescription habits. Uh, we will cover also recommendation from guidelines based on expert opinion, and we will uh, arrive to some final consideration indicating area of research. Um, why I'm showing uh, uh, this uh, this news? Uh, because actually, I do believe 45 minutes is a long uh, uh, is a long lecture, and in particular, can be very boring if you are just uh, summarizing evidence. So I I was very much tempted to have one hour video lecture uh, with the ADO on mute. I decided not to do, and I will do my best uh, to get this topic uh, a bit interesting. Um, I really like this slide. I always use it in my presentation uh, uh, because I was able here to summarize what was, in my opinion, uh, the four pillars uh, for the antibiotic prescribing. So it's not only a question uh, of patient's characteristic, obviously the comorbidity and the clinical pictures is very much important when we prescribe, but also risk for future infection. It's the bacteria characteristic uh, and it's the drug uh, PKPD um, characteristic, but also the ability to select the resistance and the very important decision if to go for monotherapy versus combination therapy. And I do believe that the decision of combination therapy and recommendation should be a very important component of any antimicrobial stewardship. There is also a fourth pillar that is the society impact of antibiotics. So every time we prescribe an antibiotic, we are not having only 
an impact uh, on the patient's outcome, but also an impact on world colonization pressure. And even more important, uh, we impact the risk of resistance in community and also of future generation resistance rate. Uh, it's also important to underline that although we believe that we got eventually new drugs for the gram negative. In these slides, I summarize uh, some evidence coming from the central data repository of Combacte Magnet Epinet, which I lead, uh, associated with some search and PubMed updated in mid-July. You can see here that for uh, four of the latest uh, drugs on the market, we have already more than 100 reports of in vitro resistance and we have more than 120 reports of in vivo resistance to the new drug, including outbreaks uh, reports. So it's, it's not an easy situation. And what we know that we can do uh, to try to, to reduce uh, the burden of resistance is very much related to the stewardship and decision within the stewardship. This is just one of the many papers uh, that are clearly showing that introducing uh, appropriate recommendation of therapy is able to reduce uh, the incidence of multidrug resistant uh, gram-negative bacterial infection, in this case by 51%. And also if you stratify taking only infection caused by carbapenem resistant bacteria, this reduction is up to 43%. And it's not a new issue, the one of combination. Uh, it's very interesting to see that even in the 56, uh, there were colleagues that already understood, even uh, in the presence of a very few antibiotic, that combination must be reserved only to particular problems in which monotherapy cannot achieve the same result of the combination. And I would strongly suggest for your cultures just to read this paper from June 58 in pediatrics. I really like the terms that my colleague is using uh, about doctor using uncritically and without analysis combination. And this also referring to misuse of antibiotic agents in combination. And it's impressive that the three reasons for using combination in the 58 are the same reason doctors are using combination today. So broaden the spectrum, delay emergence of resistance and synergistic activity. So for the first activity, uh, will not be covered from this talk. Uh, because we are referring to target therapy, and I do believe you don't need to broaden the spectrum for the target therapy, but you need to be as more precise as possible to try to reduce uh, usage of antibiotic and therefore impact on resistance. We will see if we have evidence for reduction of resistance using combination and which in vitro data are in favor of synergistic activity of combination. This is one, uh, um, one uh, of our uh, study um, financed by the European Commission, uh, where we included more than 10,000 patients in different European countries, and we prospectively samples uh, at intestinal level uh, during the therapy. What we did uh, using machine learning approach, we analyzed the impact of combination therapy, one drug, plus another and we also included in the analysis the impact of previous therapy and also the therapy after the scheme under analysis and what we found was indeed that is the monotherapy in particular with cephalosporin that has the major impact on colonization and intestinal level with ESBL gram negative uh, uh, bacteria. Uh, there is also uh, some uh, Sorry, I'm coming back to the previous slides. So there is also um, some other paper, very recent, published on PNAS, that using a robotic uh, liquid handling platform and using uh, complex uh, computational models and mathematical approach was able to show that uh, indeed combination therapy is the, the therapy that has uh, uh, the major impact on reducing uh, resistance evolution even more than cycling and mixing and reduce the number of infected patients with resistance. So there is some in vitro 
uh, epidemiological and in vitro data that is in favor of combination, but only in very specific situation. In this case, for example, the author made a strong point that the effect is there only if there is no influx of double resistance into the focal treated community. And obviously, a double resistance is very common today in the community. Uh, so in this scenario, um, we collaborated with GODP uh, for the coherence project uh, uh, that has as a major aim so to produce evidence uh, on combination therapy to treat invasive infection due to, to carbapenem resistant gram negative bacteria in adult and pediatric population. So the project was uh, um, was led in collaboration, as I said, with GODP, and we included also many different experts from uh, uh, different European countries and also from North Europe, uh, North America, and South uh, uh, America. The objective, uh, specifically objective of coherence, were to summarize the evidence on available antibiotics option, uh, assessing in vitro evidence uh, in vivo, in animal and in humans, and then to investigate the prescription habits and attitudes of clinician, uh, uh, usually dealing with the treatment of carbapenem resistant infection. Uh, so we start from the in vitro data, so we apply the systematic review and network meta-analysis. We included uh, uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, and time kill study assessing in vitro efficacy of antibiotic combination. The primary outcome was in vitro synergy based on the effect size. The effect size was stratified in high effect with ES higher or equal to 0 0.75, moderate, low and absent. The secondary outcome was the bactericidal effect and regrowth uh, rate. So we assess uh, uh, 136 study uh, analyzing over 180 combination regimens. The most frequently analyzed classes were the combination of polymyxin plus carbapenem with specific combination assessed by type of bacteria. For the Acinetobacter baumani, uh, there were many papers assessing polymyxin plus rifampin, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, the double carbapenem, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The most of the papers were assessing carbapenem associated with aminoglycoside or fluoroquinolone. If we now assess the evidence by type of bacteria and resistant partners, um, I underlined here uh, only the high synergistic uh, result with at least two strain assessed in the in vitro analysis. For the PKPD in Acinetobacter baumani, the high synergistic rate was confirmed for colistin plus rifampin. And for the TK study, other than the association with rifampin, also the association with meropenem, tigecycline, cutrimoxazole, and the association between imipenem and tigecycline and polymyxin and meropenem. We will see later on the association of this data with clinical data. In Klebsiella pneumonia, the synergistic activity has been confirmed only for three association. Uh, the first one uh, for PKPD data was the association of polymyxin phosphomycin, and for TK study, colistin plus rifampin, as for the Acinetobacter baumani, and polymyxin B plus imipenem. The situation of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is not so uh interesting as for the other two bacteria because there is a new study assessing more than two strains and showing high synergy rate so we have only one high synergy rate reported at the pkd pkpd level for the association of imipenem plus amikacin um, so summarizing the result, what was very interesting uh, um, and I think a very piece of information for us using uh, the new uh, combination uh, molecule, there were very limited data about ceftazidim, avibactam, ceftaluzane, tazobactam and imipenem relibactam. So the high or moderate synergism was uh, confirmed only for the association of polymyxin rifampin for acinetobacter and Klebsiella and very few evidence for the association of imipenem amicacin for pseudomonas. The increased bactericidal activity and regrowth uh, higher in uh, 
combination versus monotherapy was confirmed only in Klebsiella pneumonia for the association colistin, phosphomycin, and polymyxin rifampin. And again, a few evidence on the association of imipenem with aminoglycosides. So overall, for several combinations, definitive conclusion could not be drawn due to limited number of reports and limited comparability of data. So if I have to link this in vitro data with clinical data um, for the Acinetobacter baumani, the first consideration uh, is that the colistin rifampicin has been tested uh, in a clinical trial with no impact on mortality. So the Klebsiella pneumonia most consistently reported synergies that was polymyxin rifampin has not been assessed in any randomized clinical trial and the same for the phosphomycin with polymyxin that seems a, a potential promising option among the old drugs to consider. Uh, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa association of aminoglycoside plus imipenem, which showed increased synergies and bacterial activity, has been used many times even before the carbapenem resistant for the Pseudomonas as empirical therapy for blood stem infection. Major limitation for the clinical applicability of this in vitro data are represented by the nephrotoxicity of aminoglycoside and their limited lung penetration. Um, so if we move now to the evidence uh, uh, from the clinical perspective, before the coherence uh, data, we had two systematic review. The first one was published in uh, 2014 and found that the majority of study on carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis did not show statistical significant difference in mortality or treatment failure when you compare combination with monotherapy. However, three studies enrolling 194 patients with bacteremia demonstrated a significant lower mortality with combination therapy, where, be careful, combination therapy was colistin plus polymyxin or tigecycline plus carbapenem. The second systematic review was published in uh, uh, 2019. Uh, and only in subgroup analysis revealed lower mortality in combination therapy, including whatever type of therapy, just in vitro active antibiotic in blood stem infection for the treatment of carbapenem resistant gram negative. There was no mortality difference in case control study and no mortality difference in randomized clinical trial. So our systematic review included uh, uh, all the uh, observational and comparative and non-comparative study and RCT from inception to December uh, 2018. Um, carbapenem resistant was defined as phenotypically detective in vitro resistant to at least one of the carbapenems and we apply by as a network meta-analysis approach. The outcome uh, was the primary, was primary outcome was 30 days mortality and if possible attributable mortality. So overall, we screened more than 60,000 records and we included 134 study uh, with more than 11,000 patients assessed. Uh, the majority of the study were equally distributed between Acinetobacter and Acterobacteralis, less on Pseudomonas, only seven, and 21 were not distinguished among gram negative. Nine were randomized clinical trial, 19 prospective, 41 multicenter. Uh, the most important piece of information, uh, uh, we decided to have a, a very specific and detailed approach, so we refuse to close the meta-analysis if specific data on combination and in vitro activity was not reported in the study. So this means that among 92 studies that have been uh, uh, analyzed before our systematic uh, review, only 50% of them reported number, type, dosage, and in vitro activity of uh, what was included under the voice combination. And the key clinical and microbiological variables, we are very much heterogeneous and scattered among the different study. So the network meta-analysis could not be performed for any of the selected outcome, given the presence of too many disconnected components. So this is just the graphic that we, um, we tried to, to, to summarize uh, using word because was uh, the word program because it was very, I mean, it was almost impossible to summarize all the regimens that were included under the voice combination. So we had 21 different for the dual and 11 different for the triple antibiotic regimens. So the most frequently assessed 
where cabapanem plus polymyxin, and we have 608 patients for that. Uh, cabapanem plus rifampin, only 246, and tigesacline plus polymyxin, only 210. So this is the evidence we have at the moment for the effect of combination therapy. And uh, uh, this is the network geometry of outcome mortality using uh, uh, the network meta-analysis. And it's clear that it's impossible to uh, come to any conclusion for um, colleagues and the audience uh, not confident with the network geometry uh, meta-analysis. This is uh, the sample size and this is the effect of comparison. So the majority of the patients were treated with polymexin um, for the Acinetobacter baumani, and this is the example of the many different combination and comparison with the Enterobacterials. So again, no possible to conclude any anything about mortality that would be evidence based. Um, so um, the systematic review, I think, reflect very much the lack of standardization in clinician prescribing. Um, overall, the study had a median sample size of 49, a figure which is considerably low considering the estimated sample of several hundreds or even thousands of patients you need uh, for reliable assessment of association between one antibiotic and mortality. The quality of the study was overall very low and the low number of randomized clinical trial, although generally of vector quality, did not contribute significantly to the overall analysis. And I think the most important point that I would like the clinician to understand about the evidence we have and that among all those studies, only 21 is just for comorbidity and baseline severity of disease. And we know in clinical practice that the most important confundant for our analysis when we treat patients is indeed the comorbidity and the baseline severity. But only one fourth of the study adjusts for this basic uh, uh, variables. Uh, when we consider uh, mortality. After we published the systematic review, there was a new systematic review that just uh, uh, focused uh, on the new release antibiotic, uh, specifically on ceftazidim, avibactam, ceftoluzane, tazobactam, and memeropenem, vaborbactam. 29 publications, uh, including 1,620 patients, mainly with pneumonia due to Pseudomonas aeruginosus. The poor clinical success rate was 73%. No direct comparison was possible with combination. Uh, the reason why I reported this systematic review is for this information. Resistance to new drugs on the market uh, within uh, uh, a few years is almost 9% within the population. Um, and which is the usage with the, of the combination. So the third component of the um, coherence study was the prescriber prescriptive. So we developed a 36 item questionnaire addressing uh, antibiotic strategy by availability of diagnostic. We included only physician treating patients in real life. Uh, we included uh, 1,012 respondents from 95 countries. So this means we were able to stratify by WHO region, although as expected, we had a few less for Africa, um, for Africa uh, WHO region. We were able to stratify by patient's uh, age. So we had population of physician working on adult population, and then we distinguished children and neonates. Uh, we distinguished by income category of the country and availability of diagnostic and then prescribing frequency. So the low rate where the doctor prescribing uh, four or five uh, um, treatment per year and the high rate more than 20. Uh, the first uh, interesting information is related to diagnostic. So not all the prescribers in all the uh, countries in Europe, they have even the standard antibiotic susceptibility um, test. 
So overall, it's 70, 75%. As for the multi-TOF of the rapid phenotypic test, overall was available in one third or one fourth of the country. And this obviously has an impact on the prescribing strategies and should have an impact also when we write recommendation. We should consider that in particular for the empiric therapy. Uh, I think it's also very much important to underline that still 20% of the prescribers, they do not have the final test less than three days uh, of taking the blood cultures. And which is the concept of combination therapy? Um, so one, I mean, alpha 40% uh, of the respondent uh, uh, consider combination therapy uh, as two antibiotics with de some degree of in vitro activity or, or synergic but 20% uh, of the respondent thought that combination refer to simple association of two or more antibiotics that is completely uh, not associated with in vitro activity. And I think that this disagreement among respondent and prescriber clearly reflected the lack of standardized definition for combination therapy would have an impact every time we write recommendation and as an impact also in clinical study with the result that there can be very strong misinterpretation and poor generalizability of study result among the medical community. And which were the respondent uh, prescription strategy? Very interesting. We are talking about severe infection and invasive infection. So the combination of two antibiotics was the preferred strategy and the carbapenem plus the polemics in the most prescribed. The number of regimen range from 40 regimens for carbapenem resistant acinetobacter to 120 different regimens for carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis. So the doctors in our service, they could select the antibiotic they have available at their hospital. They have one specific question with description of antibiotic susceptibility of the bug, and then they prescribe accordingly. And still we had 122 regimens for carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis. Single antibiotic therapy was considered especially for acinetobacter and pseudomonas and combination of three antibiotic but we had also combination of five antibiotic was regarded as preferred strategy by 20 percent depending on sepsis sources or pathogen type. Um, if we check about uh, uh, how the combination were prescribed. Uh, the most prescribed uh, in combination was the ceftazidim avibactam with uh, a few difference between high prescriber and low prescriber. Why, for example, the cholestin and phosphomycin were used mainly in combination from high prescriber and aminoglycoside and tigecycline were used mainly in combination from low rate prescriber. Which are the reasons supporting the use of combination therapy according uh, uh, to the colleagues? The first uh, uh, reason uh, uh, is mainly improving the clinical efficacy uh, for 80% of the colleagues, uh, reducing resistance uh, and improving microbiological eradication. And you have seen, and you have seen that indeed the evidence for uh, improving microbiological eradication and for resistance is almost not existent. What about the evidence? Uh, uh, the prescriber think that they prescribe combination because of recommendation from local or international experts for the evidence coming from randomized clinical trial and for the evidence coming from observational study with a control group. So now um, the idea of the last part of the talk is to go to specific combination combination, check again the evidence available by type of bacteria and try to make uh, uh, some final uh, um, recommendation or uh, um, conclusion. So if we go, if we start from the carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis and we start with the carb carbapenem combination therapy, we have two randomized clinical trials. The first one is the AIDA trial, the randomized control superiority trial, uh, including invasive infection, uh, including urosepsis caused by carbapenem resistant uh, bacteria. Uh, the comparison is between cholestin with loading dose versus cholestin associated with meropenem provided with prolonged infusion. 
uh, the primary outcome was 14-day clinical failure. Uh, 40, uh, 406 patients randomized, most patients had pneumonia caused by Acinetobacter baumani. Uh, and the randomized clinical trial found no significant difference between uh, monotherapy and combination for clinical failure. A few months ago, uh, we had the OVACAM trial that has been presented at the ACMID, uh, and the authors also, I do not have a lot of information because it's only what has been presented during this session. So colistin monotherapy versus colistin associated with meropenem, again, invasive infection, again, IDOS extended infusion meropenem, mainly Acinetobacter biomani subgroup analysis of patients with uh, carbapenem resistant infection did not show statistical significant difference in 28 day mortality. Um, and so I think the increment uh, score is a summary of observational uh, uh, data, but can give us some indication on how to consider the issue of combination therapy for the carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis. So the increment court develop uh, a score that is very much a modified PIT score for patients with invasive infection due to uh, carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis, and they distinguish high risk for that and low risk for that. And so the, uh, the combination therapy was associated with reduced mortality only for the patient with high risk of that. So the authors concluded that patients with urinary or biliary tree infection, urosepsis, uh, and reduce the severity of infection on presentation in the hospital may be safely uh, treated uh, on single uh, uh, target therapy, if obviously available. And the explanation of the difference, uh, according to the authors, was the lower efficacy of a single drug regimen with these drugs has been attributed to the often suboptimal dosage and unsuitable PKPD profile for some of the infection sites. What about observational studies for the carbapenem uh, uh, combination therapy? Uh, there is a couple of Italian uh, cohort study, including KPC producing Klebsiella pneumoniae uh, infection, severe infection, and non bacteremic infection, where the author combined carbapenem uh, uh, with a second drug. And if the MIC well, uh, less than eight, uh, they observed lower 14 days mortality. This observation was reconfirmed uh, again uh, uh, in, uh, in the same cohort uh, uh, continued, uh, and a reanalysis showed uh, a similar result uh, with a high dose carbapenem, uh, six gram a day with three hours infusion and 14 days mortality compared to not carbapenem containing uh, combination. What about the double carbapenem combination therapy? Here, the evidence is really poor. The hypothesis uh, under the study is um, we uh, there is uh, some in vitro data uh, specifying the possibility of ertapenem having higher affinity for carbapenemases, uh, maybe uh, to reduce uh, the action of other carbapenem if you introduce it into your antimicrobial stewardship intervention. Uh, but indeed, we have only two observational studies doing that, one from Italy, one from US, uh, focusing on invasive KPC infection, uh, but major limitations are very much a small sample size and multiple combinations uh, used as a comparison. So new um, evidence uh, is, uh, um, is possible from these uh, uh, two studies. What about new drug here? Sorry, there is a typo for the cefidarocol and sefta avibactim versus combination. So we have two study. The first one is the credible uh, CR trial, 150 patients uh, uh, with proven unsuspected carbapenem resistant gram negative bacterial infection, cefidarocol versus uh, um, best available therapy, mainly combination uh, uh, with polymix in, uh, in hospital acquired uh, pneumonia and blastium infection. The trial was not powered to conduct specific hypothesis testing. Uh, what we know from the result is the mortality was higher in the cephidarocal harm at 28 days, and that as postdoc subgroup analysis revealed that the mortality difference was mainly observed among patients with acinetobacter infection. Um, there is only also a retrospective cohort uh, um, enrolling uh, around 800 patients from US, Spain, and Italy, comparing SEFTA avibactam in comparison with other antibiotic versus monotherapy of SEFTA avibactam, showing no difference in mortality 
uh, in mixed infection caused by KPC and DOXA48 producer. What about the Safta Avibactam in combination with Adstreunum? Um, this is an important piece of information, uh, in particular for the MBL, um, NDM, and VIM producing strain. So there is uh, some prospective study, in particular one including 102 patients with 82 NDM and 20 VIM treated with Safta Avibactam in combination with Adstreonum compared to other in vitro covering therapy, mostly combination. The isolate were for the majority not susceptible to Adstreonum alone and use its propensity score, uh, the study show a significant reduction uh, of uh, uh, 30 days mortality for the combination Safta Avibactam plus Adstreona. What about the combination of Mipenem Relebactam? So there is the Restore IMI1 uh, uh, study that reported the non-inferior clinical outcomes uh, for imipenem relebactam versus imipenem plus colistin, uh, predominantly against carbapenem resistant pseudomonas. So if I have to summarize the evidence for carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis, I would say uh, that the first choice uh, for invasive severe infection stay with Safta avibactam uh, for the KPC producer and the OXA producer uh, uh, strains of Enterobacterialis and for the Meropenem babobactam for the KPC producer and there is uh, no clear evidence that combination uh, therapy of the new drugs uh, uh, has uh, any positive impact on the outcome of patients. And there is no evidence for any of those combinations. Um, for patients with severe infection, in case of known availability of the new release drug uh, I was referring before, if we can use only polymyxin, aminoglycoside, or tigecycline, or phosphomycin, and we're talking about severe infection, there is a very moderate evidence for the treatment with two of this drug, choosing about active in vitro. I think it's also important uh, that we uh, think that if we use tigecycline for the uh, blastem infection and for the hospital acquired pneumonia, that should be high dosage uh, and um, that cholestine should be preferred in this case uh, to the uh, tigecycline. Uh, if we use combination uh, and we have an MIC uh, equal or less than eight uh, for KPC producing Klebsiella, we can use the double, uh, uh, the associate, sorry, we can use the association with carbapenem. And in this case, uh, it's very much uh, suggested that you go for high dose extended infusion meropenem plus polymyxin. Um, the only case where a new release drug should be used in combination based on the evidence we have up today is for the cetafdim avibactam plus azetreonam where we have seen some low quality evidence for the MBL producing enterobacterialis. There is no evidence to suggest combination for double carbapenems and uh, for low severity infection, so due to carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis, then we should uh, use uh, the principle of stewardship. So only one drug uh, according to in vitro data um, uh, of, um, of, the, uh, of the isolate and obviously according also to the source uh, of infection. There is no evidence for using any of the new drug that we did not mention now for this theory uh, infection, again according to the evidence of today. If we move now to the uh, carbapenem uh, resistant Acinetobacter baumani, uh, or colistin carbapenem combination, AIDA trial, overcome trial, they are the only two we already went through, no impact of combination therapy uh, for Acinetobacter baumani. Colistin refumping combination therapy, uh, we have uh, a multicenter uh, randomized open label clinical trial enrolling 210 patients, mostly pneumonia. Also in this case, there was no advantage to colistin refumping over colistin mono monotherapy at 30 day mortality. Uh, the same uh, uh, lack of evidence uh, 
uh, is for double cover, the double covering and other combination. We have colistin vancomycin, uh, very few patients, a bit more than 100, no difference in mortality. Colistin phosphomycin, only one randomized clinical trial in acinetobacter, 94 patients, no difference in mortality. Double covering uh, for colistin plus ampicillin subactam versus colistin no difference in 28-day mortality. The only difference in uh, uh, mortality was seen in observational study, including all the combination together. So if I have to summarize the evidence for acinetobacter infection, um, I would say um, that clearly we do not have evidence for combination colistin meropenem or colistin uh, uh, rifampin. Uh, we should use uh, two active antibiotics for severe uh, infection, uh, although the, the quality is very low also in this case. I would suggest if you have sulbactam still active in vitro, sulbactam should be preferred to colistin and to tigercycline, in particular for the hospital-acquired pneumonia and for the bloodstream uh, uh, infection. Um, and again, uh, for the not severe infection, uh, uh, we should go only with one drug uh, and we can use uh, carbapenem if the MIC is less or equal than eight, as already said for the pseudomonas. So the last bacteria is the pseudo for the acinetobacter. The last bacteria is the pseudomonas. So for the polymyxin-based combination therapy, randomized clinical trial, same AIDA, overcome, known difference. Uh, we have observational study, uh, 114 patients, mainly with uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia uh, in a subgroup uh, of full-resistant pseudomonas. So mortality was lower for combination, uh, but no difference if you include altogether multidrug-resistant uh, uh, pseudomonas. Uh, we have some evidence for the septolozane tazobactam monotherapy versus combination with colistin or an aminoglycosal coming from a retrospective study, no difference in cure at day seven between patients given ceftolozane, tazobactam, monotherapy, and those treated uh, with combination with colistin or an aminoglycoside. And uh, this is one of the few studies assessing also resistance, and there was no difference in selecting resistance between monotherapy and combination therapy. Uh, an observational study including 200 patients and comparing ceftolozane, tazobactam and imipenem relebactam to combination regimen have shown again no evidence for combination superiority versus monotherapy. So the summary evidence for the pseudomonas erogenous infection due to carbapenem resistance strain uh, is again that the first choice would be for severe infection for the new drugs in particular for the imipenem relebactam um, and uh, we have also some evidence uh, uh, for the ceftolozane tazobactam, but there is no evidence to choose a combination of the new drug uh, with any of the other drug or drug we have been reviewing today. Um, if you have no possibility for the new drugs, uh, then there is a very few evidence for a combination of two inactive drugs. And again, if the infection is not severe, then monotherapy chosen among the drugs active in vitro according to the clinical picture and the source of infection would be the first choice. So I have now very few, maybe one minute for final, uh, uh, two minutes for final consideration. Um, I think the evidence, uh, I have to say, is depressing. So for sure, there is a lot of room for improvement, but the improvement should be done uh, for the evidence. We need to produce more for the surveillance data. We do not have enough stewardship intervention, not always included in recommendation, uh, infection prevention and control that should be always included in any recommendation about multidrug resistant bacteria, evidence and availability of diagnostic um, and in vitro PKPD study, in particular for new antibiotics. I also believe uh, uh, that when you introduce a new antibiotic, uh, uh, it's also um, interest of the pharma company uh, to introduce the antibiotic according to stewardship principle within the community. So the question I ask myself, and I think many colleagues uh, share this, this question, why after so many years do we accept low quality uh, or uh, um, for low quality or lack of evidence uh, for the treatment uh, of multidrug resistant uh, uh, infection? Um, 
I mean, if we have multidrug resistant gram negative infection, that it is a substantial threat for public health and does not give uh, equal uh, rights for citizen uh, uh, for healthcare standard. The lack of evidence cannot be justified today as a problematic recruitment of difficult diagnosis, uh, in particular in high income country. Um, I make the example of uh, countries like Italy and Greece with the highest number of cases that never led neither organized any multicenter high level clinical trial and combination therapy for multidrug resistant gram negative infection so i think there is an urgent need to invest in trial infrastructure in particular in countries with the highest burden and medical education this cannot be done at the national level because it's clear that this has not been done until now but need the support and the recommendation of international stakeholders and funding bodies I think we need also to reconsider the process of publication and define some minimum criteria for quality for observational study, which should be respected by all scientific journal. And some of those paper reporting very vague information should not be accepted anymore, because I believe that the impact of low quality observational study can be enormous in terms of quality of care received uh, uh, by the patients. So, um, and I take this opportunity because I do believe that the stewardship is one of the pillars to improve also the understanding of combination and therapy. Uh, if you are starting stewardship in your uh, place and you want to link the stewardship uh, with uh, um, surveillance, uh, we just produce uh, uh, four different checklists step by step on how to implement stewardship and link to surveillance uh, in four different settings, hospitality, ambulatory, veterinary and long term care facility. All these are freely downloadable for the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy and for the EPINET website. Uh, there are many areas for research that I take this opportunity uh, to suggest. So the first, we need an agreement on definition for combination therapy. And I also had, I didn't cover that in my talk, but there is also a lot of uh, confusion about what is invasive, what's severe, what not severe, and what at risk patients for complication. Um, we need to use in vitro and in vivo, in vivo data to inform new clinical trials and push forward uh, the research of PKPD data for the last resort new drug. Combination therapy for severe infection, including association of all drugs, should be um, performed in clinical trial according to the proper study design. We need more data on salvage treatment for susceptible MDR. And obviously, in all of this trial, I think a very important uh, component should be optimization and duration uh, uh, of therapy. So my last slide uh, is, uh, I mean, uh, Every time we, we try to change something, and I, I believe we need to change a lot. If uh, we still have thousands of people dying every day for an infection that in part could be uh, preventable, and in part is related to inappropriate usage of antibiotic and misuse, then I think uh, there is something that went wrong in the way also medical doctors have been working in the last year. And usually when you try to change something, uh, you hear very frequently, well, that's just how we have been doing things here. It's how we have been always done it. Uh, so why we should change it? It's best that you don't rock the boat. And uh, I think that the burden of multidrug resistant gram negative cannot be accepted anymore as unavoidable. Uh, reducing such a burden can be achieved only with a coordinated effort of preventive measure, stewardship approaches, and active R&D for new antibiotics. We need to develop trial infrastructure linked with educational modules, in particular in countries with the highest burden. And the change in the status quo can be achieved only with the participation of all actors and the support of major stakeholders as GADP and the European Commission. And I like to cite uh, one small sentence I like, evolution is always followed by revolution. And I think we do need some revolution here to reduce the burden of multidrug resistant gram negative. So I'm happy to take a question. Um, if um, uh, there will be no possibility uh, for you to ask your question today, these are my contact details. So please feel free to contact me for any question, collaboration, sharing experience. And if you go to our website, we have also several research positions available. And uh, I'm lucky enough 
uh, to have uh, a big number uh, uh, of uh, researchers in my team that would be very happy to welcome you in Verona and in Tübingen. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Avelina. We will now start the question and answer uh, session. We have about 35 uh, minutes for that. Um, and as a quick reminder for the audience, uh, you can submit your questions uh, via the uh, question uh, bit of the platform we were on, and I think you're being shown that or how to do that on a slide now. Uh, I am very much assuming all your questions will be for Evelina this morning, I very much hope so, uh, and of course we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible in the remaining uh, time uh, allocated. So thanks very much for your fantastic talk and incredible breadth and depth of data in the uh, Avelina. I, I think you did actually mention this within your talk and it was one of the first questions I, I noticed on the, the, the questions coming in and it was really about accessibility to uh, not just combination antimicrobial therapy uh, which as you rightly uh, mentioned there is relatively limited you know sort of supporting clinical evidence for at the moment except outside of certain situations so accessibility particularly in low and middle income countries in terms of combination therapy but also related to that is the new agents what it, what are your thoughts on that uh, i mean that's uh that's a very important point uh, uh, i would say that the ability for me and maybe also for you to answer that question uh, is limited since uh, it's, it's also a political uh, it's a political issue um i do believe that we should make an effort uh, uh to give a possibility to all the country to use the new antibiotics and um, i mean there are many tables all over europe uh, uh, and the commission uh, uh, talking about uh, how the pharma company uh, should be in a way compensed if they reduce uh, the, the the cost of the drugs and uh, and provide the drugs also to medium and low income country. Uh, I also believe that since the problem is now, and again, it's not within our possibility to change it immediately, would be very much important if we try to build up a, a good recommendation uh, uh, in this setting. And my impression is that every time uh, major stakeholders or society, they work on recommendation and just uh, cited uh, IDSA as well as ASCME and as many other all over the world, we focus uh, on high income country. And I think there are some of this information like, um, uh, I don't know, choosing sulbactam versus cholestin versus tigercycline, or uh, we didn't talk about ESBL, but also ESBL is an issue. And I would say that ESBL, a urinary tract infection, if sensitive to cotrimoxazole, can be treated with cotrimoxazole, but we never go to this specific detail uh, on the rule of some of these drugs, also in multidrug resistant. So I think that we, we should work on two different levels, improving the evidence for what is available, and on the other side, push a lot for major stakeholders uh, uh, to improve availability. Okay, thanks, thanks, Evelina. And sort of relating to that was a question and a comment really about the development of uh, new antimicrobials and just really commenting that in most of the new existing uh, the agents that have come to the market recently um, have not been from new, uh, anti, you know, brand new anti, uh, microbial classes that have been really more of the same sort of um, agents. So, I mean, we're talking about combination therapy this morning. Is there a role to look at the development of combination combinations of antimicrobials, antibiotics to, together? Should we be, I mean, we tend to develop antimicrobials as single agents, don't we? Or traditionally that's been the case uh, outside of the beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitors and, and, and you know, drugs like cotrimoxazole um, uh, that, that are specifically developed in that way. What about developing sort of combinations of antimicrobials together? Is that just pie in the sky or is that a realistic potential there? Uh, again, uh, uh, very smart question. Uh, um, 
So the issue uh, in combining uh, existing uh, uh, classes or molecule um, in a way is an advantage because obviously it would reduce the production of the drug uh, and uh, also the assessment uh, of the safety uh, for many of the components. Uh, uh, but in what we have seen uh, until now is that this would accelerate the development of resistance. Uh, so what indeed uh, uh, IDSA already started to ask uh, many years ago about the new drugs. Uh, it's, uh, it's very much about the point that we need new classes uh, because new drugs uh, of existing classes, uh, in my opinion, uh, is just reducing the burden for some time, but not really making the difference. So the real investment should be in new classes. And I think that 10% of resistance and more than 1,000 patients already with resistant uh, strain of new antibiotics born by linking two already existing classes is just a demonstration that this is an option, uh, but I would not invest on in that if other options uh, for new classes would be available. Okay. I mean, and and you, you know, touched on very well in your talk about the lack of evidence to support a combination antimicrobial therapy, even for sick patients with quite resistant in, infections uh, that's available uh, at the moment. And if anything, the data supports monotherapy. Um, so, it, you know, if, for example, we develop a brand new class of antibiotics, what, what's your, you know, would you be happy to use that therapy? You know, this is a very pragmatic, cold-faced clinical question that, you know, many physicians around the world face uh, all the time with the newer agents, albeit not brand new classes uh, necessarily. Uh, but if we do have, you know, uh, you know, you get a brand new class of antibiotic, for, you know, that's, that's good in resistant gram-negative infections, you know, should we be using it as monotherapy based on the paradigm we have at the moment? Or should we be trying to, I guess, protect it, if you like, with a, a second agent. So it's a $66 million question, really, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if this was your question of one of the uh, No, 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 it, it, the it was someone else. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's with just... A, with a bit uh, of me, with a bit of me type Provocating <laughs> me, because, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure some, I mean, some of the colleagues, uh, uh, we know each other, and... Uh, Let's say that we open here a very sensitive issue that is also related to the link and the collaboration within prescribers and pharma company, because that is what we are talking about. Uh, and I would say that uh, we have two different groups uh, of uh, medical doctors. One that is are actively collaborating, uh, if I can, I'm allowed even uh, too much collaborating, and some uh, that, uh, and I would put myself there, that uh, are very stubbornly refusing. Um, and uh, I think the issue for me is that the point of view of the patient is different from the one of the pharma. So if I'm producing uh, a new drug, um, I must introduce all the stewardship uh, principle to use that drug in the proper way and this means that should be that's very much my personal opinion should be even the duty of the company to produce enough uh, pkpd data uh, enough microbiome uh, testing uh, that could be possible even during registration trial so sh if i would have more information about the new drugs about the capability of selecting resistance, then this would allow me to do the best therapy for the patient. Uh, but in the way the market is built now, uh, I do not have this information. Um, the second topic would be the surveillance. When I introduce a new drug into the market, uh, should be, again, an obligation, in my opinion, in this case, of the country and the authority for the drugs in the country to follow up that drugs and uh, uh, assess as soon as possible resistance. So if we link independent surveillance with more information uh, uh, from in vitro, in vivo data and uh, independent study, 
then I will have enough information uh, to use the drug in the proper way. And it's not true that I need a lot of time because it's just a question of regulation. And if I can establish that before putting the, the drug on the market, then it would be better. Nowadays, it's just some of the medical doctor pushing for one drug to be included as more as possible. And some others say, no, just wait and we, we need a bit more information. So um, I think that it's very a question uh, of rediscussing how to include a new drug into your hospital formulary and into the marketing at national level. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. So uh, someone asked a question about the microbiome and obviously when one is uh, using a combination therapy, uh, I would imagine there's more impact on the microbiome than if you're using monotherapy, obviously depending about on the, the cover of uh, the combination agents versus the monotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, there's a differential. I know there's a differential effect here with different agents. What, what's your thoughts on combination therapy and the impact on the microbiome? Because we never used to think about the microbiome when we prescribed antibiotics I mean, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, really, you know, and it's only really, you know, so much evidence recently emerging on the impact of um, changing one's microbiome, for, however that happens through antibiotics or through um, other mechanisms and, and the impact that can have on health. So what, what are your general thoughts on that? Uh, again, uh, uh, very, very important question. This was one of my points uh, uh, in the assessing a, uh, a new antibiotic, because as you said, um, uh, we, we are not used, uh, at least our generation, uh, uh, is not used in thinking in terms of microbiome because was not uh, was not there when 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 we started uh, uh, our consideration as medical doctors. Uh, but today, if I'm working on a new molecule. I think one part of my assessment should be on the impact of microbiome. What is also true that we learn during this year is the microbiome is very much a personalized microbiome, meaning that what we observe for ESBL uh, is that the microbiome is influenced from uh, uh, even the diet of the, the patient, but also all the other drugs. So it's not only, we, we make a mistake if we believe that only antibiotics are changing the microbiome, but because also antihypertensive uh, or cardiovascular drugs are changing in a different way the microbiome. Um, so uh, it's, it's difficult to, to define overall the effect uh, of therapy, like what when we observed only the presence of the ESBL at intestinal level, indeed uh, association of two antibiotics had uh, less impact than the monotherapy if the monotherapy was cephalosporin. So it was very much depending on the type of antibiotic. Uh, I would say that is the duration of the therapy that is making a huge difference on the microbiome, even more than the molecule. Um, so for, with the information we have in this moment, uh, what we can do uh, is probably to try to avoid uh, uh, cephalosporin and uh, uh, and macrolide, uh, if possible, uh, uh, in a patient with high risk of multidrug resistant infection uh, as a monotherapy, and to try to reduce the duration of antibiotic as more as possible. Because I'm pretty sure, based on the evidence data we have, that each uh, therapy in the majority of the hospital in the hospital can be reduced of at least two three days because we have a tendency as a doctor for severe infection to indulge a bit uh, in the in the duration of therapy even if we have evidence I know it's difficult I do it also sometimes <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We tend to go for this what we feel is the safest option, and of course in fact in reality it may not be the safest option uh, for the patient in the, the, the longer term but uh, we do tend to do that and we all do it don't we so someone's asked a question about uh, combination therapy uh, initially in the I guess in the empiric setting dealing with a very sick patient with possibly a resistant infection and they were specifically asking asking about high inoculum um, infections so I guess that you know that goes with severity and, and you know can sometimes be go with resistance as well and then they were they were they were asking really about the role of de-escalation later so I, I suspect 
what the what the, the question is really meaning is you know is it reasonable to start with combination therapy in some settings and then de-escalate to monotherapy uh later on what, what what's your a thought and approach to that sort of scenario you are selecting the best question uh so i already said during the presentation that i strongly suggest guard p to have one webinar on empiric therapy because it's, i mean it's 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 a very it's a very important question so uh, and it's daily life okay so thinking about empiric therapy uh first uh, uh, introduction uh, let's talk about last uh, uh, release uh, drugs because i would expect the question is on that should i introduce uh, a new drug as empiric therapy uh, so, if we are not talking uh, about uh, infection, where in reality time is making a difference, then I would prefer to delay the usage of new antibiotic until I have uh, the possibility uh, to have uh, the etiology. So, talking about uh, urinary tract infection uh, or a skin infection uh, or, uh, let's say, less severe infection. If we are talking about uh, an infection where time is making a difference, then I think the, it's very much the history of the patients uh, and uh, the colonization, uh, so the local epidemiological setting and rate of resistance in, uh, in patients at the moment uh, in the world, um, and colonization. Because this is also a very important uh, question uh, uh, for the regulatory agency. Uh, when we need to take a decision about uh, giving uh, one new drug uh, the approval for the empiric therapy. And we usually say, uh, if the patient is colonized with one specific uh, multidrug resistant bacteria in the last six months, um, or if there was a previous treatment uh, with a, a wide spectrum antibiotic uh, uh, with no response. Um, so I'm still uh, reluctant to have it in all patients uh, if there is no risk factors at patient level. If there is risk factors at patient level, I'm less afraid in using a new drug if there is a good de-escalation plan at local level. Then uh, if you don't trust your microbiology, not because of the microbiologist, but because there is some issue with diagnostic, or you do not have it at local level. Maybe you have to send your samples and get back the result in a few days. Then I would say if the risk is high, then go with the new drug, but be ready in de-escalating the minute you receive the antibiograms. Then would make a huge difference in terms of risk of resistance. Okay, so that's de-escalating, not just the from, I say, combination to monotherapy, but also yep. from broader spectrum therapy to narrower spectrum therapy, according to emerging microbiology in that individual patient. Is that right? Yeah, correct. I mean, uh, yes, it, your, your question, sorry, uh, was including also from combination to monotherapy. Yeah. Yes, exactly the same. Yeah, 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 definitely. Great. So um, th there was a question about in vitro tools uh, to assess combination therapy uh, and I guess that's built around really this concept of, of synergy uh, and this question was very much uh, about excluding antagonistic antibiotic combinations and asking which are the best in vitro tools for that and that's a very specific question but uh, I, I guess for the clinical coal face that maybe a more important question is you know, some of the methods we use in the research setting are quite different to the methods that are available. So, you know, for example, you know, the, the more gold standard methods for assessing synergies such as broth microdilution, et cetera, et cetera, um, versus, I mean, we don't, certainly in the UK, we don't tend to do that. It was certainly not routinely in the laboratory. And of course, there are other methods using, you know, sort of MIC test strips and so on and so forth. Um, so well, what are your thoughts? The microbiology is so important here. The diagnostics are so important here, aren't they? Because it allows you to do what we were talking about in the last question, which is to de-escalate rapidly the quicker we get the diagnostics. So what are your thoughts on uh, sort of the uh, sort of to, the in vitro tools we're using at the moment in clinical practice in the labs. Yeah. Where, where uh, do we need to go with that? 
Yeah, that, that was my last suggestion in the area for research, indeed, yeah. uh, because I uh, I completely agree uh, with the the person who did the question that the tools we have now, at least from clinical point of view, uh, for the assessment of in vitro efficacy, um, are not uh, uh, calibrated uh, uh, with the clinical uh, needs. Um, I think that's an issue of translational research as well, uh, because my impression uh, with the, all the work we have been doing for GARDP in reviewing the evidence uh, is that sometimes there are some of the study that are not done uh, together with clinicians. And the same can be said uh, on the other way around. So there are some uh, even drugs that are developed uh, in my opinion, without really asking needs of clinician in that specific moment. So I think the question I, I cannot answer, which would be uh, the best tool uh, uh, from a pharmacological point of view, uh, because that's very far from my specific expertise. Um, but uh, what is very much needed is that the discussion starts, because for sure the clinical trial should start based on what the colleagues uh, are uh, assessing uh, in vitro in the labs. And so if the in vitro research is not discussing with the clinical research, then uh, obviously there is this lack of bridge. This is, this is a gap in what we are doing from one side to another um, that is not helpful. And you have seen that the evidence we have in vitro is not very much useful for the clinical trial with very few exceptions like pseudomonas, uh, is completely unuseful. And I would suggest thousands of different experiments that would make sense for me as a clinician. Yeah, sure. And I mean, I think that touches on a, 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 another question and it's really all about, you know, the importance of collaboration and working together to tackle these sort of issues. Uh, but Dr. Anusha from India um, was, you know, mentioning about the importance of collaboration across uh, countries and continents, of course, to, to understand uh, the demography and and different resistance mechanisms and how we can feed that into uh, both prevention and, and treatment. And, and I think that's something you mentioned in your talk. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, impressive, important topic. Uh, um, I, I do believe uh, in networking. Um, and I think that each team uh, improves enormously, uh, also from clinical point of view, treating patients, if there is a possibility to exchange um, information, uh, experience. So this is the approach, for example, we use in UKIC. So um, together with some colleagues, uh, uh, we created the European Commission on Infection Control. And uh, one of the major issues for this committee uh, to try to, in particular, to solve the issue of resistance and the prevention was the concept of metacompetence. And when we say metacompetence, we want to say that it's very much important that, uh, for example, if I work uh, in, uh, in one specific country A, where the problem of pseudomonas is very limited, I should talk a lot with Italy, Spain, or whatever, India, where the issue in ICU is very much important because it's through this collaboration uh, that we can improve each other. And there are many tools that the European Commission, uh, JPI, IMR, GARDP, uh, put on the table uh, to improve collaboration among centers. I can tell you from my side, uh, where we do a lot of research with many different countries all over the world, it's not always so easy to find uh, collaboration. So we try to develop a tool in AskMid, uh, so where you can uh, uh, put your center online and ask for collaboration. That, to be honest, I was enthusiastic about, about it, but did not really fly. So it seems I was the only one seeing that, wow, that's the really good idea where everybody can collaborate with each other. But indeed, at the end, everybody's collaborating with the usual group of friends. Um, yeah. So I can answer only from myself. Uh, I'm happy to collaborate with everybody. Uh, but please check the call of the stakeholders I cited because very frequently now 
they have specific place for non-European countries inviting for collaboration, like orchestra. We have in COVID patients, uh, I have a very strong collaboration with India uh, because it was request also from the European Commission. So there are many courses that are helping, also providing funding for that, but everybody then should check that. Okay, so thanks, uh, Evelyn. That's fantastic. Uh, so you mentioned ICU uh, in, in that answer, and um, one of the participants has asked about the evidence. And I hate to hate to mention the word COVID nineteen, but uh, one of the participants uh, has mentioned about uh, evidence for combination therapy for gram negative infections in the ICU uh, within the context of COVID nineteen. And uh, his or her personal experience uh, was that monotherapy did not work. Uh, double and triple therapy uh, seemed to be better. So, what what's your thoughts and experience on that? Uh, okay, COVID-19 obviously ruined my life as all the other <laughs> infectious disease physicians all over the world. Uh, so first suggestion, uh, it's an impressive good uh, topic for a new webinar for Gadpi. Uh, <laughs> but um, I mean, we, we have been facing uh, uh, a lot the issue of the increase in multidrug resistance in ICU uh, during the COVID-19 uh, time. And this uh, yep. uh, was due to many different reasons. Um, if I have to be critic here, I would say that one of the issues why we had this problem is a reduced uh, attention to infection control uh, measure. I know it sounds uh, strange and weird because everybody was just uh, an astronaut uh, within the, the ICU, but this does not, this works with COVID for your own protection, but it's not working for transmission. So I can tell you that reducing the end washing between patients, uh, reducing changing your uh, uh, over, um, over coat, uh, and many of this basic uh, hygiene measure was responsible for an impressive increase. So first of all, I think the new stewardship uh, we are developing, uh, even in my center, related to COVID-19, and I do hope we will never be in that situation of last year, uh, we'll first of all focus uh, on what we miss in infection control. Yeah. And uh, I don't think the patients with multidrug resistant COVID positive were different from the others. What I have seen in my experience is an uh, over prescribing of antibiotic. Like there are articles published where some authors said everybody getting the ICU during COVID 19 got piperacillin tazobactam because of yeah. the high risk of multidrug resistant infection. That does not make sense in my opinion. Yeah. I know there is a risk. I know everybody was aware we were terribly tired. I mean, there are yeah. thousands of excuses. So yeah. I'm not pointing my finger because we all yeah. made mistake and we did a lot, but that is very, I mean, I would not do that. Then obviously that you select multidrug resistant. So yeah. we should think about it. Yeah, so in terms of COVID really, it it's really about, infection prevention and really good antimicrobial stewardship and we know that if you do that the minority of patients get secondary bacterial infections in COVID-19 so so they're the really important aspects and then you don't have to worry about combination therapy really do you because the patient doesn't get the infection in the first place uh, so yeah that's very good advice I think there Evelina um, so yeah, so a question uh, about using old antibiotics to try and reduce uh, the use of carbapenems, particularly in carbapenem susceptible infections. Obviously, we've been talking about carbapenem resistant infections this morning. So, you know, what's what's your thoughts and the evidence base on using combinations to try and, uh, I, I guess, um, yeah, you know, sort of reduce our carbapenem use and 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 re reduce the further development of carbapenem uh, resistance. Is there is, is there is there much leeway in doing that? Uh, yeah, I mean that was um, a, a very relevant question uh, uh, in all the uh, rounds we do for stewardship. Uh, uh, because obviously our aims uh, is is very much including reducing carbapenem usage. Um, to be honest, 
uh, there is no evidence uh, that using combination of old antibiotic uh, or the other option was to use to introduce ertapenem um, in order to reduce the uh, the selection of meropenem uh, was really working. Uh, there are very few studies, uh, low quality, that are trying to prove that. Um, but in my knowledge, uh, uh, we, we never proved uh, that introducing erstapenem or introducing combination is very much reducing resistance. What we proved uh, is that the duration of therapy, again, and try to reserve carbapenem only to severe infection uh, with high risk uh, is making a difference. Um, I'm sorry because this sounds uh, a bit boring, but <laughs> I, I trust the stewardship. Uh, yeah. And I would not say that stewardship, even in my hospital, is perfect uh, because yeah. the work to change um, habits in prescribing, not of the infectious disease physician, even in some of the infectious disease physician <laughs> actually can be difficult, uh, yeah. but all the others uh, takes years. And so I would very much concentrate on that. The first step would be to have a local recommendation based on stewardship. That's in my experience is reducing a lot the carbapenem usage in geriatric wards, uh, in surgeons. Uh, so there I would really go to try to reduce uh, the, the usage. Sure. Okay. And, and and this is a very specific, I mean, we've only got a few minutes left now. This is a very specific question, but I think an interesting one. So someone's actually asking about a very specific form of combination therapy, which is selective decontamination of the gut or oropharynx in the ICU setting. And of course, that's often prescribed in com you know, it's combination therapy effectively. So they're really asking, you know, they're saying there's huge controversy about that. In some areas of the world, it's used widely. In some areas of the world, it's not used at all. What's your view on that? And do you think that contributes to the development of resistance? Another easy question for you there, Evelyn. Uh, okay, no, I mean, I will keep the conflicting results. I, it's not my opinion that will make a difference there. Um, I know it's very much uh, uh, Scandinavia versus uh, the, the rest of the world in terms of uh, uh, decontamination in ICU. Um, I agree with the colleague making the question uh, that is very conflicting results. Uh, personal opinion, uh, um, I believe uh, that introducing uh, a selective decontamination uh, is associated uh, with uh, risk of resistance. Um, and the reason why I do believe that um, is because the effect uh, should be assessed also in high endemic uh, uh, centers. Uh, because obviously, if the assessment is done only in center without a huge problem of resistance, it's like we do not include the colonization pressure at world level and hospital level and community level within uh, the effect of the selection therapy. Um, so, um, I'm not convinced uh, about the lack of risk uh, of uh, selective decontamination. Um, I would say that maybe there is some place where uh, there could be a sort of compensation, like I think one area for research is definitely the hematological patients and oncological patients, where uh, you have uh, a high number of uh, gram negative uh, uh, of patients uh, positive for uh, uh, colonization with multi drug resistant uh, gram negative at hospital admission. And then uh, you know that the uh, chemotherapy will increase the risk uh, of severe infection. Then maybe there could be the place uh, for a trial to check uh, if uh, a temporary decolonization could temporarily reduce uh, the risk of infection. In that case, I would say that the risk of developing and changing the microbiome could be compensated uh, by reducing the risk uh, of uh, high-risk mortality, severe infection uh, in uh, immunodepressed patients. Otherwise, I still need a bit more uh, evidence uh, to be completely convinced. 
Okay, so, thanks, Avelina. So we'll make this the last question uh, now, as we just have a minute or so. So, um, firstly, uh, the participant says thanks for an excellent webinar, and I, I should say, Avelina, a number of participants have uh, uh, stated that in the questions. Uh, so, based on your meta-analysis and other published studies, if one is designing a randomised controlled trial of combination therapy, two or more antibiotics, what is the most important data uh, to collect? Uh, okay, th th that's a very that's a very nice question. Uh, meaning that I I mean it's very much depending uh, on the type of combination on the type of infection. Um, but for sure, if I'm starting now a combination, I would collect a, a stool sample uh, and maybe link with a center to perform a microbiome analysis uh, uh, because that would be a very nice piece of information. Uh, I would collect very detailed information about comorbidity and other drugs uh, and uh, if there would be a possibility to make, uh, now I'm saying everything like uh, the perfect uh, idealistic study, but even choosing only one of two of these would be great. Uh, also having blood sample for uh, some uh, uh, determination of uh, blood concentration uh, uh, and PKPD analysis uh, would get that the perfect study. Okay, that's fantastic, Evelina. Um, so we have now come to the end of our question and answer uh, session. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all participants, uh, particularly for the uh, excellent and varied uh, questions. Uh, and once more, and most importantly, I'd like to thank uh, our speaker today, uh, Evelina, who's provided us provided us with an excellent uh, talk and has uh, responded to uh, a whole variety of uh, questions uh, in this area. So I'm now going to hand you back to uh, Victor for some final words. Thank you, Gavin, for moderating today's Q&A. And of course, thank you, Evelina, for your fantastic presentation. We will soon be announcing our next webinar. You'll be able to register for this through the Revive website where you can also watch recordings of all our previous webinars, read antimicrobial viewpoints, and also access our openly accessible resources, which also include videos, as I mentioned before. Make sure to keep out an eye out for our emails to stay up to date on the next events. So that will be all for me. Thanks everyone for joining today and for contributing to the discussion. I hope you found the webinar interesting and useful and that you'll join us again in future. Please do spread the word amongst your colleagues to join as well in future. Thank you and goodbye.